Hey guys, welcome to the LT Brings the Heat podcast. We're your hosts, Sean Laird and Adam Heisler, where we talk about baseball and sports performance. With topics ranging from coaching, business, and player development, our goal is to bring you a no BS approach to development in baseball and sports performance. Hope you guys enjoy. Let's rock and roll. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of LT Brings the Heat. We're your hosts, Sean Laird and Adam Heisler. Uh, we got a special episode today. We're going to talk about a couple of topics that has kind of been running through uh, Adam and my uh, mind and certain things about social media, uh, social media gurus, and, and kind of how we track improvement and lessons. I was having a, a conversation with one of the, the dads recently, one of my clients, about you know how I track improvement and stuff. And it was really it was a really good conversation. And I'm, I'm really eager to hear Adam's uh, point of view from the Heisler Heat. Um, but Adam, how are you doing today, man? No, great, man. We're excited to kind of have this topic today and talk about different things. Uh, also going to talk about bat speed and how much that plays into exit velocity testing as well. And I know these are big things coming up. They've already got some showcases going on right now if you're watching on Twitter. So it's crazy to think about they're doing these in January, but it's the life we live in. So if they're out mm-hmm. there, they're testing them. Our athletes have to be ready for them. So that's what we got going on down here. What about you guys? Yeah, we're doing good, man. We're in the middle of a week three. We just finished week three of our VLO program. Guys are getting in and building up. We had some guys already PR on numbers they've already had in the past on that that first uh, that first baseline testing after three weeks. So that was really cool. Um, kind of moving into the strategy of, of breaking down guys and in, in long toss and, and breaking down mechanics because sometimes like we had Zach Thompson on. Uh, it was like three or four months ago, and he was talking about when he would expand in long tosses mechanics would kind of fall apart. So I've been kind of following as much as I can mechanically on some of our guys, especially the young athletes that can't use their legs and stuff. Um, so I've been really focusing on legs and getting a lot more leg drive. Um, so we keep the arms obviously fresh and keep them healthy and building them up because high schools are starting to build their bullpens. They should be, I would assume most high schools in Indiana should be starting their bullpens either this week or next week. Um, and so the last three weeks have really helped build them up in the, the three weeks before then when they were doing their kind of ramp up before the, the actual program started. So I'm excited to see kind of results and, and see the guys keep moving up in the world. That's for sure. Yeah, that's awesome. And actually there was a guy in the other day came from the Baton Rouge affiliate with the Knights that was in Monday. And uh, he was talking about how do they do long toss basically inside. And I mentioned that you guys up North don't get to get outside during these weather. So they're all the time doing their long toss and how, what, what exactly they're aiming at why they're inside the cage and kind of, is there a certain market that, 15 feet, 30 feet, whatever it is. And then we start aiming higher into the sky. And the best way I try to put it was just to kind of visualize yourself out there on the field. And you know how far is 75 yards on the football field or how far mm-hmm. 100 yards is. And you just got to kind of trick your brain where you're going to feel like you're throwing straight up into the, to the net. But that's actually where you're releasing that ball when you go out there on the field. So coaches, just use some imagination and make sure these kids are, when they're doing it, if it's a mass effort day, like they've got to get fully max effort out of it. So I've seen some coaches do readings up top. So they'll find a ladder and stand on top as high as they can and tell them to throw them in that direction while they're long tossing to making sure that their numbers are still where they need to be whenever they're uh, starting to stretch it out some too. So that's good stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, to kind of get into our first topic today, um, as I was saying before earlier, I was talking to a dad about how we program and, and, and watch and track progress and lessons. Um, and so any, anytime you're doing, I mean, you can do data for this as a, as a, as a coach and you can mark and, and, and track exit velocity and stuff. And you can also track movement patterns and watch them on video and certain things like that. Um, obviously when you're doing this, like we don't know what they're doing outside with us. So the, the weight room plays, it plays a role into the development as a hitter as well. But when you kind of get new guys at them and you kind of track them over a long period of time, what are some of the things that you really focus on when you're one kind of building the confidence of the player? Like, Hey coach, like I, you know, I feel like I'm hitting better. Um, you know, but some kids like young guys, like I got a 13 year old, he's hitting lasers and before his lasers would be every now and then. So he would, I would say he hits line drive percentage in, in our, in our uh, lessons, I'd say 60% of the time now and before it was maybe 15 to 20% pulling everything. Now he's hitting all fields, but he's still, since we're constantly, I'm constantly on him all the time. He's like, Oh man, I don't feel like I'm getting as be- good as I should. And his dad understands it, but kind of how break, break that down for you and how you kind of progress and, uh, and, and teach these athletes how their progression is and, and how you track it. Yeah, and it's a great question that they had brought up because a lot of people want to know, are they are they getting better? And uh, it's easy to say. It's, yeah, he's getting a whole lot better. Look at him. Where it's mm-hmm. when you have some numbers that are behind everything, just kind of like in the weight room is if you prove that Sean's getting me stronger, 
like here's the data of I've went up 15 pounds of my bench press in two weeks or for an example. Now you're knowing you're actually getting stronger as opposed to just kind of feeling it. And so now you kind of have some proof to the pudding and you can really feel yourself dive in deeper as you chase these goals like we talked about last week. So some things we do for day one testing is we'll do a video for day one assessment, which I think is very cool to see where they're at day one versus day 30 to see the difference if they've been working consistently and swing changes, uh, swing pass, swing plane, if it's a throw on or if it's pitching, kind of the same thing in their mechanics. And then what we'll do from a pitching side, let's use that for example, if they've been in shape, their arm's ready to go, we'll do an initial assessment on a run a gun, a run a gun, and then we'll do an assessment off the mound, or if they're just a position player, kind of like a flat ground throw. There kind of gives us the base to see where they're at. So now that month down the road, we can track when we do a retesting to see they've jumped three miles an hour or whatever it is. And so it helps them understand that what they're working for is it's paying off, but it also helps them understand too, is we talk about a development's not always just straight uphill, like you're going to have peaks and valleys. So it lets them know exactly kind of what phase I'm in. So guys don't get discouraged if all of a sudden you hit a peak and then you start to drop down a little bit. It's just part of the, the development process and our job is to kind of rebound you and get you back to where you were. So from a hitting standpoint, same thing we have, like I mentioned earlier, we got the video, but then we'll put them on the hitting rep soda unit that we have. And we honestly, we don't do it much off the tee, really barely do it off front toss anymore. We really do it for live just because it's the most consistent way to help them get to what they're going to feel on the baseball field. So we'll do a live BP round, two rounds of 10, kind of check them out, see where they're at. Now, the big thing that we've kind of changed early on, we love PRs, which we all do, but we were getting so caught up into what was their max exit velocity they've ever hit and kind of overlooking the path of what is their average exit velocity. So you might have a kid that he hit an 85, but he sits around 74, 75. And so now you're kind of thinking, what are we, are we really building a consistent hitter here? We're just kind of building the guy that every now and then he'll run into one. And so we kind of changed our process into, yes, we'll still track what their top number is because everybody wants to know that, but let's track and see how close they are to that top number consistently. Mm -hmm. So with the Rap Soto unit, it measures every single hit you take. Now, if there's like a miss hit or a misread, we'll go in and manually delete that and get that off there. Cause sometimes it will misread if you hit it straight in the ground and pop up a 95 when you've been sitting 82. So we kind of know <laughs> that that was a mystery there. So we've got to take that one off, but it gives the hitter a great correlation of how consistent are they making hard contact. And so we'll put a plan together and then we'll kind of track them. And what we've done lately with the pitching rep and then with the hitting rep Soto is we don't let everybody get on it every single time they come in. So early on we used to, because it was fun. It was the new toy. Well, we started seeing guys slowly get so worried about that that they were forgetting about their swings, their approaches, and everything they had been working on because they're so ready to turn around and look at the TV to say what it said. Hey, how hard or how far? So now it's almost – we space it out in between every other lesson or every three lessons that the hitter gets to use it to kind of track and see where they're at. Now with our hitting programs, they use it every other week whenever they're coming in. So we'll have like a competition day with each other. Hey, what was your average exit velocity last week? All right, we're two weeks down the road. We've made some adjustments. We've been in the weight room. Let's see if we can get that number higher. And we kind of put a competition on together. So it's, hey, you got a round to 10. We got everybody around the cage cheering you on, and you get 10 swings to let it rip and see how hard you're hitting the ball consistently. And then we'll do a PR one, and that way we kind of track their results of each and every day going up. So then we'll go into a spreadsheet on Excel. We'll get that set up for them. Now they're – they have access to this as well. They can see their improvements, where they're at. Do they need to work harder? Are they not doing enough on their own? And it will be able to tell. And it kind of just is the end all be all of the development process. And it's just like anything else. It gives us another key to the whole puzzle of, all right, we're doing our part of track and all this stuff. Now, how do we implement new drills, new training that this athlete needs to do? Cause there's one thing just to track all this information, but if, you're not getting these kids better then you're kind of just wasting your time and you're collecting a bunch of data for no reason. So our job simply is to first assessment, break them all down, build a plan for them. And then we consistently try to check it maybe every two weeks, every three weeks and see where they're at going forward. So what's kind of the things that you do with your hitters as well as your pitchers to help them understand to see their gains that they're making and not just have that feel of, Hey, I feel like I'm hitting the ball harder coach Sean, but am I really? Yeah, absolutely. And so <clears throat> I kind of on the same page as you, I, I will say we used to make, um, 
I don't want to call it a mistake, but I think we put too much into exit velocity off the tee with the hitters. Um, and we started doing it at one point in time, we were doing it at the beginning of every month or at least like every four to six weeks. And it got to the point where guys did not give a shit what their mechanics looked like. They were just trying to hit the ball as hard as possible. Um, and, and what we, we kind of started gauging is now we're probably doing exit velocity every three, three or four months. Um, and obviously the same thing with you do and what you're talking about. And I, I really harp on this when it comes to our velocity and our pitching programs is, you know, well, I like the max, your max increase is awesome, but I want to see that average increase. I want to see what you can produce day in and day out consistently. And I want that average increase to go up. So like at our velo programs, I explained to them, like, yes, we want to increase that max, um, and hitting as well. Like over the course of the off season, we want to increase that max, but I want to, I want to increase how many times you're bar- barreling the ball up at a high velocity consistently over and over and over and over. Um, and so when it comes, I'm a big, I'm a big improving the movement quality of players first. Um, so like if I have a kid and I will record, I, I actually record them off the tee cause I like to see how they work. And then I'll record them in BP, uh, at the end of the lesson as well, during their first lesson. Sometimes we, we talk a lot, we runs into the, the second lesson that we'll do this on. Um, I was actually analyzing a kid yesterday and I, I'm still trying to find his BP one. I found his T one, but back in the videos and stuff, I'm always trying to compare like, Hey, what's this kid trying to do on the T versus what this kid's doing, um, at the, uh, uh, during BP that way I can see, okay, if he's, some guys like to swing down on the T cause it helps with their feel. Um, if that kid is hitting line drives and, 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 you know, hitting gap to gap and he's swinging down on the T I'm not going to mess with him. But if I see a kid swinging down on the T and he's chopping and has that negative attack angle BP, that's a problem. So then we have to adjust his kind of how he works, um, on his own. Um, and so the big thing with me is let's like to make sure we keep the barrel in the zone for a long period of time and let's stay in there for a long period of time. Uh, so we can barrel up as many balls as possible. So basically on video, I'll break down how long or how short or whatever their bat path is like. And over the course of time, you'll say, okay, now here's where you're at. Here's where you're consistently in your bat path. Um, here's your attack angle. Um, and this, these are things that I want you to kind of understand, like this is better. This is going to help you be in the zone for a long period of time. This is going to help you barrel up more balls so they can actually see the difference in the bat path. I also make sure that they understand the, their hips and how their hips are involved because that's a big, big, big thing is you'll see guys that are quote unquote using their hips, but you watch them on video and they're really spinning or they're drifting and kind of spinning off. And they think that because their foot rotated, that they actually use their hips, which you and I both know that's, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's true that you're using your legs. Um, so we, we progress by actually seeing them on video, seeing the progression on video. Obviously we'll do the exit velocity as well. <clears throat> and one thing that I really like to do, so I kind of, I kind of track them on screen toss. So what I'll do is we'll do what I call around the worlds. Mm-hmm. So we'll do eight swings outside. We'll do eight swings inside. We do eight swings middle. And what I'm trying to see is how many lasers that you can hit, how many line drives you can hit on those 24 swings. And usually the first day, I, and I will just say this because this is a majority of kids that come uh, for hitting lessons. I will say 70% of them try to pull everything. Mm-hmm. Um, now, they don't understand spraying the field. They don't understand what, you know, and what scouts are looking for is for power to all fields. And so they're like, oh, I'm going to yank this ball down the line. And you see it on Twitter all the time. And on social media, you see guys that are just, you know, taking these huge hacks on the tra- hit, hit tracks. And they're like, oh, man, look how far I hit that ball. And that's cool to have fun and do that every now and then. Absolutely. But I, I feel like that we see that a day in and day out. And there's a big newsflash for those guys is everybody can do that, do that at the next level. That's not a rare thing. It might be rare at, at your high school. Um, you know, with 1500 kids, but it's not, it's not a rare thing going to the division one level against the best players in the nation. So what I really, really harp on is like, Hey, let's focus on, you know, what our routine is going to be and let's improve upon your routine. So we track them just like in the weight room. Like if you're increasing your technique on the squat uh, bench and deadlift, um, that's progression. Same thing as a hitter. If you're, if you're increasing your movement patterns, those are better you're getting better there. If you're increasing that best out of 24, so say first day they pulled and they had seven, eight swings that they hit line drives on and they were only on the inside part of the plate. Well, next time we do that, let's see what they do. And we're looking at that 18, that 18 plus reps of being consistent in that screen toss. Cause in screen toss, if, if we have the same tempo and we same rhythm, I always tell the guys like, I'm not changing my tempo and rhythm. So this is a basically, can you repeat a good swing path over and over and over? That's what I want to see here where I'm not trying to fool you. I'm not trying to do anything crazy. This is all about your mechanics and your ability to repeat your swing. Um, and then always like within three or four months, you'll see guys hitting a lot more line drive. So I show them the progression there and they get more confidence in that. Plus it also helps them building confidence to hitting to all fields. Cause 
I, I just had this conversation with a kid. Um, this is months ago, but he was told by a coach that he couldn't hit opposite field. So we, we had to spend time for three months building his confidence to hit the ball the opposite field. Um, so he would believe that. And, and to me, like, that's one thing that people don't understand. It's, it's hard to track the, the, the mental game. Like, Hey, is this kid have more confidence? Um, and that's why I think it's really built. It's, it's really big to have relationships, no matter what people say on social media, no matter what people say about, Hey, we're data and we're science backed. Um, you know, this, this game is about building relationships because if you can increase the confidence in a young man or a young woman, and over the course of four or five months, that increased confidence it helps them on the field, but it also builds them into a better man. But it also helps their work ethic because if they have that confidence that you're building into them, they're going to want to work harder. They're going to want to do these things more often than not. And so I, I also will track basically the relationship with the, with the athlete. Like, hey, is this kid have more confidence in his swing? Does he have more confidence in, in these drills? And then obviously we do the exit velocity and we, and we track those things as well. Um, with ours, and we were just talking about this before I came on, um, our exit velocity numbers are really off when I, when I mean by that is our balls are hit thousands and thousands and thousands of times over the course of a year. So I'll preface every time we do exit velocity, like, Hey guys, like your numbers are going to be lower here than what you would be at your showcase when they're using pearls or something really nice. So I don't care what your exit velocity was. Just like when pitchers say, Hey, I hit 88 on the gun and they come into us and they're hitting 83. <laughs> so yeah. Yep. Not, I, I don't care what your exit velocity or your throwing velocity was at other places. What I care about is what you started at with me. And that's how we're going to increase mm -hmm. from there. Um, it's just like, you know, going to certain meets in the weight room, guys will show up in the weight room. My guy squat 400 pounds and they'll come in and they can barely move 300. Like again, not telling kids that they're liars, not telling them that they're, they're, they're being misrepresented, but uh, there's also pretty popular showcases when they first started out that they were kind of padding stats a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, I'm not going to call it any names or who, but I just, I would see, I'd see those numbers from those kids on certain websites. And then I would see them with me and they didn't match. So mm -hmm. that, that's one thing is we have to, we set realistic expectations where they're at. And I understand, and I tell them to understand, like, it doesn't matter what you've done in the past. It doesn't matter what you've done at this showcase or this school or whatever. If we're starting at 85 here, you know, your, your sophomore year, I want you in it at 90 plus, you know, by the time you're starting your season next year. And I want you consistently hitting that velocity higher, but that was, I'd say that's the biggest thing that me and you are on the same page about is we got to make sure the, the average increase, the average exit velocity and average velocity off the mound, the effortless velocity off the mound specifically, that is what I'm looking forward to when it comes to actual numbers and then the movement pattern, what I can see on, on video, seeing their movement, seeing their barrel in the zone for a long period of time. And then lastly, as I was talking about, is the confidence in the athlete. Um, and that's things that parents notice the most is the confidence in the athlete. And that's things I take the most pride in for sure. Yeah. And the hitters, you got to understand too, is like, if you don't have an exit velocity reading or you don't have a rep, so whatever it is, is you understand when you hit that ball hard and when you didn't. Mm -hmm. And I think more kids have to understand is when they hit the ball in the barrel, just have barrel awareness because there will be some that they'll swing and they'll swing, hit it off the end of the bat. And then I'll ask them, where did you feel that? And they got jammed and they didn't have any barrel awareness there. They thought they hit it off the cap and really they hit this it was right above their hands too. So it goes back to just learning and feeling what's going on right there. So that is such a big thing that I've seen lately is just some of these kids get so used to looking at these TVs and readings that they don't even know if they hit it well or not anymore because they're not actually feeling that motion. Kind of like when, Lid Bloom was on back one of our first episodes talking about how important it is to feel these motions yep. and not be told by somebody or look up and see this number pop up on the TV. Oh, okay. And then we'll even have, when we do do the hitting rep soda, like I'm, you're not allowed to look back at the TV if you didn't hit it well, like you've got to start learning. Oh, I got into that one. Let me check that one out. Whereas if you swung, I mean, I've seen kids swing and miss and they look back there expecting to see a reading. Yep. <laughs> I don't know what they're doing. I said, buddy, you just swung and miss. I don't know why you're looking. Oh, I'm just so used to it. Yeah, well, we've got to get out of that because when you play the game, you don't have this TV sitting right there <clears throat> that you look at to hit. So it's good and bad. And, and like we said, our whole job right here is to try to blend everything together and, and make the best athlete we can make out of it. So, And pitchers, if you're out there saying that you throw 90 and maybe you've ever hit it one or two times, Hey, you have to explain to people that's what you've topped at. That's the highest you've ever been. Don't say you throw 90 miles an hour because you probably pitch at 86, 87. It's just the way it is. So say what your top is and then what your average, you're basically, this is what I throw in game. I sit between this number right here because that's what's most important. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, 
getting kids to understand that young athletes to understand that is it's, it's, it's hard because everybody wants to see that bottom line. They want to see that, that, you know, what, what, what is my, what is my biggest number compared to this guy and that guy? Um, and at the end of the day, you know, it takes what it takes to get to the next level and, and they've got to buy into that process. They got to buy into, Hey, those numbers will take care of itself. If I'm doing what coach Adam is telling me to do, if I'm doing what my weight room coach is telling me to do and so on and so forth. But we kind of touched on it, and well, as we were talking about the progression of guys um, and lessons, let's talk about the social media and the kind of the Twitter atmosphere. Especially, Twitter is like uh, just an absolute cesspool full of know it alls. I don't know about you, but majority of people I've met in my life, I I, I feel like that they um, let me put it this way to be blunt is um, the the percentage of smart people that I've met that work really hard in life is very few. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like most people just do enough to skate by, do enough to be average. Um, you get on Twitter. I mean, there's a million of Heisler heats running around just kicking ass and taking names, right? There's a million yep. of former big leaguers that know how to do everything and or guys that never even played past high school that know how to do everything. So kind of what's – like when you get on Twitter, kind of what's your opinion and, and what do you see on things? And, you know, I know you enjoy it a little bit, but there's also some of the negatives to it. Um, kind of give us your opinion on Twitter and all these know dolls on social media. Yeah, it's kind of like when you go by a bad car accident and – you drive by, you want to look to see what's going on, but at the same time, you know, like, dang, that is a sad situation that just happened right there. Mm-hmm. So it's very similar to how I view Twitter. It's like, and I'm, I'm going to get on, I'm going to scroll, I'm going to see different stuff because I do really get some really good ideas from different people on developing, whether it's hitters, throwers, athletes in general that I do enjoy. And then, unfortunately, there's the other side of the spectrum that you have these certain guys out there that are just trying to bash every single one every single person that's trying to put a drill up to maybe help an athlete that they work with. So they go out of their way to put this drill up and it's not an end all be all. When they put this up, it's to do almost free advertisement of, Hey, this is something we've done with our hitters and it's really helped. So guys give it a try if you're having a problem. Well, there's one certain guy on Twitter, Jeff Fry, that was a former ex big leaguer that has created this cult of just bashing every hitting guru out there, so to speak, is what he calls it. So mm-hmm. if he ever sees a video of a guy using a drill, say a connection ball is involved or a, a tool, automatically he's like, man, I didn't do this, and I made it to the big leagues, so why are kids being taught to use these certain things? Mm-hmm. Well, number one, he didn't make it to the big leagues. He did. He was very successful. He was a 280, 300 hitter. I'm not sure exactly, but – Maybe he was developed and had a good swing when he was young and he never had to implement these certain types of drills to get into a good swing plane. Yep. Now, when these kids are coming in our facilities, they're not 100% or even 80% the athletes that they're going to be one day. So they're very young. They're learning how to move their bodies in the right direction. So if there's a certain drill I need to show so-and-so because their hands are dropping and I put a connection ball above his shoulder so he can feel – don't let my hands drop because the ball is going to fall and then I'm going to swing and it alerts me right away. My hands are dropping. Then I'm trying to swing as opposed to feeling straight to it. Yep. And so if you put up a Twitter, if you put up a video like that to try to help people out. Oh man, somebody may like it, but then this guy is going around basically bashing people and saying that this is nonsense. We've got to stop this. These instructors are making millions of dollars off these they're getting these parents to buy into all this nonsense it doesn't even matter and he's trying to get all these ex-big leaguers to get together and talk about how guys that are posting this stuff are doing it just for the money so to speak and he Mm -hmm. calls them out about it all the time there's one guy i remember was going through a crisis during the covid stuff and he basically just asked for if anybody has anything to make a donation like please help because my place might go under well jeff comes in and comments like do not help this guy. He's preying off young, uh, young guys chasing exit velocity, basically, so to speak. So he was basically telling people not to go donate to this guy that puts his blood, sweat, and tears into his business to try to get kids better because maybe he likes doing exit velocity testing. So it's just, it's, it's a scary slope to go down, and we talk about it all the time. We send screenshots back and forth, and it's honestly one of the things why – I don't put up as much as I want to put up. And it's not mm-hmm. the fact that I'm scared. It's just like, it's not fair to me to post a video of a kid that's 14 years old and he's working on something and he's not going to have the perfect swing right now. It's just the way it is. And to kind of give him publicity or give him shout. And then all of a sudden somebody comes in because there's going to be a keyboard warrior that, Hey, he's not doing this right. You might want to fix that. Or, Hey, what is that? A launch angle swing, whatever it is, so to speak. And then yeah. there's nothing good comes from it. So the big thing on the Twitter is this, 
You can get a lot of really good stuff. I once had a, a hitting coordinator with the White Sox. We share ideas with back and forth. He's still with them right now. And uh, he just texted me one day at the blue last year. and like, hey, who's your fee- three favorite guys to follow on Twitter for a hitting standpoint? And I spit out three names, and he's like, wait, two of those guys don't like each other, and they do the total opposite. And he says, so how do you like? How are they both in your top three? And I said, well, it's basically I just pick and choose what I like for one guy, and same with the other, and then you can try to implement it to different people. So we talk about hitting all the time. It's not dead set one way to the right or to the left. You can blend this stuff together. And so basically I told him this is – I make my own chili out of the hitting stuff, and I just put it all together, and hopefully it tastes good at the end by trying to do these different things. So it's not, hey, you have to follow this one certain guy and that's the end all be all to this. So there's a lot of really good stuff, but unfortunately there's some bad stuff out there as well. And you got to be cautious of it. And you never know who's listening out there. Jeff may get a hold of this and try to come after us for calling him out. But the sad thing is this is a grown man. He's an adult. He is an agent. He represents players and he's out there bashing these people and this like let's have good conversations. Let's not automatically assume that that's bad. Let's have conversations about it and if we agree to go our separate ways, then it is what it is. But be open-minded about all this stuff. I feel like there's so many closed-minded people these days that it's hard to have conversations with because all they want to do is prove that they're right the whole time as opposed yep. to, hey, there's something I can take away from this. Let's do it. Yep, so absolutely. Kind of your, uh, I feel like mine was more of a PG version, so I'm ready to hear what yours is going to be about right here. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> obviously like we, we, we've talked about Jeff doing things like that and – I, the, the problem is, is in, in, in the 2021, we live in this world where I think that people think they have to agree with everything that other person says. Like, I'm going to tell you guys right now, listen, like Adam is a great friend of mine. I love Adam to death. We are not going to see the same page on every single topic there is. Yep. We live together. Didn't live, didn't, didn't have the same opinion on certain things. Does that change my opinion on Adam? Hell no. And I think we're in a situation where, uh, especially with all the politics and all the stuff going on, like, Everybody thinks, well, this person thinks this way, so I hate this person, or this person does this thing, so I don't believe in that. This guy's a piece of shit. Um, that it, for those that are listening, like it is okay to have a difference of opinion. At the end of the day, and this is why I always say, at the end of the day, us as instructors, we're trying to make kids better. And and for Jeff, I think he acts like a little bitch all the time. Is what I think essentially is like, like real men don't act like that. Real men don't have the time to get on Twitter. And, and say these things. And, and he's probably a really good dude in real life. I would assume like, obviously he wouldn't have a following or wouldn't have friends and wouldn't be an agent if he didn't have a following. I mean, I would assume that he's success, successful if he's an agent, former player. Um, I have no idea, but what I do know is, is like, like I have three kids. I'm wanting to have four or five kids and, and I, I want to make sure that I'm being the best example for my kids and lifting people up. If I see something wrong, I'm going to call people out, but when I'm on social media and I see stuff and if I don't like it, I just skim through like that guy's doing his own thing. And this is the most important thing that I'm going to say is we don't understand the context of what is going on in that post. People don't understand sarcasm on posts. People, you can't read some words and immediately know what's going on. You can't even watch a video because you don't know what the video or or the purpose of the drill was. And and I remember the one that we were talking about the other day is this guy was working on some guy was working on a split grip and, and swing drill. Uh, which me and you both use split grip for multiple reasons. We love the drill. We've done it a million times. Um, we, th- we have no idea what initiated him to start that video, what the kid that is doing that started that video. There, Dave Tate, elite FTS, he's a world-renowned strength and conditioning coach. He runs probably the best um, performance um, equipment in the world when it comes to strength and conditioning. He's a guy that always says like 80 to 90% of guys that make it to the professional levels would have made it no matter what he said th- like, like that's what he thinks like they are born with an elite level skill elite level talent that they can just kind of work just a little bit or or just work at an average work ethic and they're going to make it to the big leagues or make it to the nba um and i there's a lot of truth in that I, I i it's impossible to know the exact percentage in that but for guys like jeff fry that performed at a high level and and you know kicked ass and take names i got nothing but respect for the guys you know performance to play at the highest level possible there's only been what like 19,000 people playing the big leagues or whatever that number is. It's very rare. But for him to assume that everybody has to do the things that he did in the way he did them and to call people out of certain things, um, you know, that, that, that's very, very egotistical. And you got to even talk about like the guy who runs driveline, Kyle body. Yeah. Kyle body. I've heard him talk a couple of times and he even himself 
um, who used to kind of bash people on Twitter. I used to see him doing stuff like that on Twitter, Twitter all the time. But even he himself, like I, I had a face to face conversation with him twice and he seemed like a really good dude. I really liked what he had to say. And he even says it's very egotistical for me or anybody else to say, this is why all these UCL injuries are happening. This is why this guy is not doing this. This is why that like, we don't know the answers to everything. We will never know the answers to everything. And when you approach Twitter and I think he's obviously doing it to be on a front, he's obviously wanting to showcase, you know, who he is or what he thinks he is and, and be a keyboard warrior and call people out. And it's not just him. There's other people. There's other people that I used to follow. And I would see them do stuff or I see them say things. And I was like, oh my God, this guy, I would never be friends with this guy. I don't like this guy. I don't like his attitude. And so I just unfollow him. Do I, do I run my mouth about the guy? No, because I'm a grown man. And I say, you see something I don't like, I just look the other way and go do my own thing. And, and that's the thing. And I think that it's more about how many likes can somebody get? How many people can, it's like going into school and, and, and Jeff is like that kid at school with a bunch of his buddies. He starts making fun of somebody and he wants people to laugh because he feels insecure mm -hmm. about himself. Like that's what it reminds me of. It's like, dude, like, you know, you have to have confidence in yourself in order to not freak out or get upset about everything that you see. And to me, that's a lack of confidence. That's a lack of, you know, uh, belief in who he is. Cause there's a lot of guys at the end of the day, like if he's calling out people because he thinks that this guy's trying to only increase exit velocity in players, I'm going to tell you right now, you don't have to call people out or say those things. You know, if somebody wants to ask me an opinion on somebody face to face, I'll give it to them. I would not say anything to somebody else. I wouldn't say to that person's face, 100%. Um, but we've got to understand something. And this is what's most important. Sooner or later, if people are only looking and they're, they're giving this charade and they're saying these things and they're, they're being fake and they're, you know, changing the radar gun. So it reads plus three mile an hour and stuff. Those guys are going to get found out. It might be one year from now. It might be two years from now. It might be next week, it might be five years from now, but sooner or later, the truth will come out about these people. There's always something, those guys, the people that don't have good morals and don't have good ethics, especially professional business ethics, sooner or later, those guys get found out. You could skate by for a period of time and faking it, but you have to be real sooner or later. Cause when real, like if you run into a real dude, like real recognized real, I always talk about people in fighting and stuff. There's people that run their mouth all the time people that, you know, listen to this song and they think that they're hard asses when they get around another hard ass, you find out real soon that this what this person's all about. Um, and I, it's the same thing. I, I'll run into coaches and, and baseball coaches when it comes to the weight room, I hear them talking about the weight room and they look like they haven't walked a mile in, in five years, uh, look like they haven't lifted weights in 10 years. And they're sitting there trying to tell me what they have their kids do and what's best for them. I'm like, okay, dude, whatever, man, you know, do you do your own thing? Um, but again, I, I, I I don't want to get into it anymore. I guess I don't want to build onto it anymore because it just, it fires me up because I just, I don't have respect for men that act like that. And I know you, you believe in that and things are, are black and white with me a lot of times. And obviously I need to be, have grace and, and stuff like that when I see people. But at the end of the day, like that's not how we build the game. There's a reason like you don't want to post certain things. I won't post certain things because it's not fair to a 14 year old kid. If he gets attacked, if his swings, like not a certain way, like I remember I posted this pick of some, our video on somebody on YouTube, one of my kids. And this kid was chopping everything in the ground, rolling over on everything. Um, and he was bat dragging at times. Um, and we kind of flattened out his swing path. He was starting to hit more line drives, but the bat drag would creep into a swing a lot. But I mean, the kid like increased like a hundred points in his batting average or something stupid like that the next season. And somebody's like, this is, he's still dragging. He's still bat dragging through the zone and like, no shit, dude. Like if, if I could fix something, if I could fix all mechanics in one year and fix everybody and they'd be good to go for the rest of their lives, I'd be a billionaire. We'd all be billionaires, right? It's a progress. It's a progression of over time of getting a little bit better, getting a little bit better, getting a little bit better. Nobody has clients that everybody that's perfect, you know, and there's that other guy, um, Richard, what's his name? Yeah. Richard Sant Skank. Yeah. 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 Skank, something like that. Um, basically like saying, Hey, let's compare your hitter to my hitter. Let's compare the worst hitter to your worst hitter. Let's, let's, let's see who, who, who helps guys increase and get better and better and better from there. Like it's easy to sit there and say, Hey, I'm going to hear my best to your best. You know, that's fun and all and everything. But what I care about is where a kid starts and where a kid uh, ends. I want to see each individual kid's progression. You know, it's fun. Everybody wants to work with the best of the best, but to me, what's most important in running a business and, and, and building these relationships is I want to make the kids that don't have confidence, have confidence in themselves. I want to make the kid that is an average high school baseball player and do a great high school baseball player. And I want to make those great high school baseball players into professional ball players one day. I want to help them and guide them through that process and teach them how to work. 
Um, but yeah, I, uh, I'm done with my rant. It is what it is now. But, yeah, but that, I mean, that's why we do this stuff is to get those guys to that certain level. And mm-hmm. there's, you mentioned it earlier is God has blessed some people with so much athletic ability and our jobs to try to help them reach that maximum potential and some's going to be higher than others. And so that's why we do what we do is try to get the most out of them. And if they went from a nine hole hitter at the park ball to, Hey, now they're the three hole hitter on their team in that following year. Like that is a huge improvement and they've gotten better from it. Mm-hmm. The last thing with Fry is, uh, a mutual friend of ours that does hitting as well, he had messaged me two months ago probably saying, oh, I guess I just made it. Fry's blasted me on Twitter. And I, at the time, I don't follow Jeff, so I didn't see. So I go and look, and sure enough, he's on there getting broke down. Like, why is this guy doing a certain drill with his kid? And I don't think Jeff realizes, like, the impact he has is on these instructors. And, like, this guy was mentally not in a good place, and I could feel it. We just talked through text, but he was just like – man, my, some people I work with around town <clears throat> are finding out about this and now they're questioning what they do for their kids because they think yep. it's not right. And he's and I said, look, the main thing is you have to remind these parents is, are you using your eyes? Or is your kid getting better? Like, do you visually see it? If so, then yes, these drills are working for them. Now, a big misconception is everybody thinks we do certain drills with every single person that walks through the door. Yep. And I specifically remember Jared Barnes that played at South Alabama. He was a catcher. He was with the Marlins for a little bit. One day he just contacted me. He's like, hey, Adam, man, I'd love for you to check out my swing before I head down to spring training. So I, he comes in, he hits. And, I mean, we hit for 45 minutes to an hour. And afterwards he's like, so, like, what do I need to work on? You got anything from me? And I'm like, Jared, in my opinion, you're locked in right now. Like, I literally saw maybe one or two things that we can that you continue to work on of keeping your chest a little bit more over the plate on the outside pitches. But besides that, like, you're ready to roll. And so I think people just assume that – Every time somebody comes in, it's we've got to break them all down and then let's start over and we're going to build a certain type of swing. And, and when he, this was a professional level athlete, so he already had perfected that pretty much. So now he's ready to go, go with it. So it's just a part of the development process that makes it so fun of when you're nine, nine years old before puberty, you're going to do something a certain way probably. And then after puberty hits, you might have to be taught so many different things because you've got new limbs and you grew four inches and now all of a sudden you've got to get everything working again. So it's just this ongoing process that never stops. And that's why we continue to learn and try to do different types of stuff to, Hey, what's something I can get. I'm having a hitter's trouble with this and we'll message each other about it as, Hey, I got a hitter struggling with this. What would you recommend? And then you told me to stand on top of my head and try something like, Hey, I trust John. I'm going to try it and see if it works <laughs> for this kid. But it's mm-hmm. just the, the relationship you have with guys. And so, and it's something you don't have to post all over Twitter. And I think while we're talking about this too, is like, I see so many people like want to, I guess, state claim to these athletes. Like if yeah. they played for this travel ball team, one tournament, like oh, that's considered their guy. And it's just, it's frustrating because number one, the athlete deserves all the credit. And we talk about it all the time on here is, the coach, we're a very, very small part of it. We're out there to try to get them to their best, but these are the athletes that are doing the great things on the field. So, number one, they deserve the credit. Then after that, don't go 10 just because he played a tournament with you that now he's officially your guy and you put up a banner in your facility because he played there or he hit there one time or whatever it is. I'm just, I think that's where this whole social media world, it's, it's a slippery slope and it stinks because these kids should get so much of the credit and not have to worry about who they're trying to – I want to post this video, but so-and-so might get mad because we used to hit together. Now we don't, or I want to post this, but it was with my old travel team. Now I'm on a new one. So I'm kind of stuck in the middle here. I don't know what to do. So yep, yep. Yeah, that's just kind of, I think we both view things very similar in that standpoint. Yeah. It's, I see it all the time. There's, there's a few, there's a few organizations that, that try to state claim on kids. There was one kid that I, I took um, or recruited, I shouldn't say took, I guess I didn't use the right word there, but I, after the season was over, I recruited him to come to our tryouts and he came and, and ended up making our team and his coach got on Twitter and started blasting our organization and, you know, passive aggressively, I, I would assume a bas- bashing me by saying he, he contacted all these colleges and he got all these, these scholarship opportunities for this young man. Um, and, and now he's going off and going to do something else. I'm like, wow, man, that's, that's cool. I guess that kid didn't do any of that stuff for himself. Right. I guess he didn't have any skill in the first place. And <laughs> there's certain instructors that are around that try to poach other people and say things and like, Hey, you need to, you need to come train with me. Cause you need to get to this next level. You know, whoever you're with got you to, to love you right now. That's awesome. You need to come do this. And um, you know, it's just, it's, it's a nasty business, but it is what it is. Like for me, when I post things about kids, I'm congratulating work ethic. Mm-hmm. And I tell kids like some kids like coach, why don't you post me on the gram, man? Why don't you do this? I yeah. go, 
I'm going to post people that deserve it. I'm going to post people that work hard. Like, you know, I've posted kids that increase seven mile an hour from 60 mile an hour to 67. And people are like, Oh, who cares about 67? That kid cares. That kid does. Yep. And that's a big, that's a big deal. Like that kid worked to get those numbers. Like I, I just posted uh, one of my longtime clients that hit 97 on the gun and he deserves that hundred mm-hmm. percent. Um, he's built his the last six years. He's been busting his ass to get to it. Young guys. Like there's a kid right now that's wanting to hit 90 and he started last, uh, August at 80 mile an hour. And he's at 86 and constantly trying to increase and constantly trying to get them stronger and better. I'm like, dude, just like you were saying, it's not a steady state increase. It's got, you're going to fight. You're going to have some plateaus. We're going to work through this and we're going to keep getting you better and better, dude. Um, you know, and, and guys like Jeff, man, like those guys, like I guarantee Jeff would not call and talk to people like that in person, like face to face. Like that's just, I guarantee that wouldn't happen. And, um, you know, if he does, like, I'm sure he'd get popped for it. There's people that act like Jeff are the ones that have never really been in fights before. Never really had to, had to, you know, get basically have responsibility and take discipline from their actions. Like that, like where I come from, like you don't do that stuff without getting popped for it, but it is what it is. But I think, I think we, we obviously are trying to do things the best way we can. And I feel bad for that one guy saying people are running around asking questions about, you know, Hey, he's, he's attacking me. And people are saying this at the end of the day, like, you know, attacking somebody's business and stuff, you know, it, obviously it's BS, but I'm sure he kicks ass and take names and the results speak for themselves. Like it doesn't matter what people think or say, it's just like on, on Twitter and, 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 and social media and Facebook, like they can control the facts and say what all they want. But, you know, unless you're there and actually see something happen, um, what you see online is 80, 90% false. Um, you know, it, it's just, you have to actually see stuff and get a strong opinion. Like trust your opinion on your relationships in person with people. Don't trust what you see online by some guru who thinks he knows it all for sure. Yeah. And I think it just creates a tough atmosphere where if you don't like something, scroll past it. But now if you have a question about why somebody's doing something, cause you're, you generally want to learn and care, then that's perfectly okay. But nowadays I think people are too scared to even ask Hey, why are you doing a certain thing? Because then they're thinking, well, why do you care? Are you trying to attack the hitter that I'm working with as opposed to just answering it just like a coach, just like if we were all at a convention together, we would ask ideas off each other and bounce mm-hmm. some stuff and see what we can learn. And I think now it's just people don't want to do that. So I've done it privately where I'll message them through DM and just be like, hey, I didn't want to draw attention to this, but can you help explain why you're doing something? And the person was super honest and everything was good to go there, but it just sucks that we couldn't do that out there in the the open and have these general discussions for people to learn because there's been, I think now we're seeing way better swings in 2020, 2021 than we did even back in like 2016, 2017. Mm -hmm first started doing this like kids are getting better and i think they're learning a lot off the social media of learning these different types of drills and learning what works for them and the dads are getting smarter too it's like hey i follow the certain guy on here and we don't go to him he lives three states over from me but we just literally try to implement all the stuff that he puts up on twitter and it's working for us and it's like hey that is awesome that's what this is supposed to be used for is to spread the game and to the learning never stops but you have the unfortunate ones out there that are running around just to try to make a name for themselves. That's a sad situation. But let's move on to something a little bit more positive. Sean, I had a question last night from a dad that was asking what are probably the two or three best exercises or movements to help out with creating more bat speed. So what would kind of, how would you attack that, that question right there? Yeah. So I always, and I say this with every, like we've talked about this a million times, um, but the number one best, uh, but for bat speed and power is the deadlift. Like if you're in the weight room, like, and I'm not talking about the hex bar deadlift. I know people love the hex bar deadlift and it's a good exercise. I'm talking about straight bar, conventional deadlift, um, or sumo deadlift. I personally, from what I've seen, I like the, I like the, the sumo deadlift for pitchers a lot. Um, really getting that, that, that force production, like you would similar to what you do on the mound, um, for hitters and stuff. And I do both. So don't, I'm not picking one or the other, but I like the conventional deadlift cause it really builds, you build your entire posterior chain. You get strong as hell from it. Um, I had unbelievable results when I was a player hitting, doing deadlifts. I've seen unbelievable results from my players doing deadlifts. I can't stress that enough. That's the most important exercise for power and speed, bat speed and, and, and throwing velocity. Number two is another thing that you're going to know what I'm going to say is, is sledgehammer training, sledgehammer hitting a tire. Um, when Adam and I were in the summer, right before our senior year, we started really doing some sledgehammer training and, and I was attacking and I did a little bit when I was younger. I kind of just a little bit, I seen boxers do it a lot. Like the old school Muhammad Ali videos of chopping wood, Floyd Mayweather chopped a lot of wood, the amount of rotational power and velocity that you can get 
from doing sledgehammer training. I'm not talking about like going slow through the motions, hitting a tire. I'm talking about you're going balls to the wall. You're trying to hit that sledgehammer as hard as you can, as fast as you can on a tire right out in front of you. We do cross tire on big tires. We alternate arms back and forth. You can change the stimulus and change the exercise constantly. Um, but that builds real man grip something like those, those people that do those, those, those hardworking manual labor jobs. There's a reason why they call it old man strength <laughs> and that grip, that grip through the core and, and the forearms. Yeah. I actually saw somebody that, I don't even know who said this, but like three or four years ago, some guy said he, he quit pro ball, um, and did for three or four years worked on, um, uh, I, I don't know what he, he's doing something where he was swinging a sledgehammer all the time, some kind of construction business. And he said he showed up and he, the hardest he ever threw was like 89, 90 mile an hour. He threw 96 off the bump at a random tryout. And he said, the only thing I did was manual labor swinging a sledgehammer. And I was like, <laughs> dude, I'm a, I like how this guy thinks. Cause this is exactly how I think. And I've seen, yeah. huh? Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. And I was like, I was like, man, that's, that's, it's so cool to see other people kind of find their way. And like me and you talk about all the time, like you'll see guys doing, like, I thought that I was the only one doing this drill and you see five or 10 other people on social media, they're doing the drill through. It's like, man, it's so cool to see everybody's progress. But other than that, um, the other thing, when I want to call for, for bat speed training, and this is something that people see all the time, but they don't do it correctly. is basically, I want to rotate as a maximum velocity as possible. So I love med ball throws and med ball rotational throws. And the thing, the biggest mistake I see guys do is they do he too heavy of a med ball. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll see guys like, and I will say this, like you have to do different exercises in the med ball. You have to really test your velocity and how hard you're throwing the med ball. But I really love using anywhere between four, six and eight pounds for developing that rotational power, developing that rotation as fast as you can. A lot, I see a lot of guys and our guys specifically at LT, they try to grab that 12, 14 okay. 16 pound med ball. And those have their places. Of course. Um, I like doing those for more overhead triple extension, bomb tosses and stuff like that. Um, but you want to move the med ball fast. You want to move it explosively. I really love going up the ladder from four, six, eight back down the ladder to eight, six, and then four. And we'll do sets of two with about 10 seconds of rest in between. Um, and I'll have guys do high reps as well. They'll do sets of 15 to 20 at the end of the workout. That's more like conditioning work capacity type stuff. Um, but they're basically getting rotation on both sides of the plate. What I've seen a lot of is I've seen a lot of guys that not know really how to rotate efficiently. So I'll put them on a wedge. I'll put them up against the wall to really force them like, Hey, I don't want you to move your arms at all. You're just going to fire your hips and let the ball go naturally. Um, those things right there. And I'll add a fourth one too. And this is something that you can find a, a ton of research articles that, that say this is false, but swinging a heavy bat is a, is a game changer for velocity, mm -hmm. um, increase in um, hitting velocity and exit velocity. Like I have a video that I, if people sign up on my website, they could sign up and watch a video of me swinging in a six pound. Like I have an old black magic. I filled in with like dirt and rocks and stuff. It's like six pounds or whatever. And I, literally will show you in the video. I swing that hard after doing an exit velocity, a certain mile an hour. And then I'll, I'll hit my bat again after using that. And I increase my velocity. I'm almost immediately. And all those, um, research articles will say, well, it's actually teaching you to move slower. Um, it, you might feel like it, but, and you'll see other studies where yes, maybe you're swinging slower, but actually your mind thinks you're swinging faster. So you swing faster. So yeah. there's, there's both ends of the spectrum. Like for every article that says, Hey, this doesn't work. I could find an article that says it does work, but I can testify, like we use the hitting jacket, we use uh, bat weights, we use wrist weights sometimes for, for velocity, have the kids put on a wrist weight and they'll swing. Um, those things dramatically help. Now, I will say that th this, I'll end with this, is that all four of those things you have to do consistently. If you're not doing them consistently, consistently, you're not going to see results. Like sledgehammer training needs to be at least two to three times a week. Obviously, you can overtrain with all these. Med bowl training, I would say two to three times a week. Deadlift doesn't have to be that much. It's just be one day you know, a good amount of volume working up to hard, hard, heavy weight. Uh, if you're doing lightweight with deadlifts, it's not going to have the same results as working the low weight, uh, or sorry, the low reps, high weight work. That's what we want to work max effort with that. Um, but, and then obviously the weighted, like if, if it affects you mechanically, when you're using weighted swings, it's not going to help you make sure it's not, it's not too heavy. Like I could swing six pounder. Cause I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm six, three, two, two thirty, and I can swing it. I would never put that in a kid that's 170 pounds and can barely swing his current bat. Like I'm only going to add maybe a six ounce, nine ounce weight on his bat. Um, so those are kind of the, the things that we utilize at LT all the time. And we, 
I change, I will say this, I change how we use them every four weeks. I don't want the body to get, I want it to be long enough to where the kids kind of understand how to do it, but I change the volume. I change the reps. I change the stimulus every four weeks. So they understand like, Hey, let's not continue doing the same thing over and over and expect a different result. No, that's great stuff. I think you know that whole thing right there. So guys, if you're out there listening, start adding these things to your routine. If you can't find it, email one of us, hit us up on Twitter, Go to Sean's website, go to his YouTube channel. He's going to have examples of these different types of drills that you can start adding into the routine. I think the biggest part is you mentioned doing it multiple times a week. Don't just do this once a week and think it's going to be the end all cure all. Then challenge yourself to it. So when you're throwing that med ball, throw it as fast as you can, as powerful as you can. I think too many guys just throw through the motions. And like you mentioned, well, their ego gets involved and they want to grab that heavier ball just to say, hey, I'm throwing this 12 or 16 where – That doesn't even matter. Throw that six ounce or six pounder as hard as you can, and then you're going to start to see some big time results. And the kind of correlating back end on that one is I feel like I see a lot of young kids that are in that 14, 15, so let's say teenage years. The ones that have bat speed now are physically stronger, like you had mentioned. But I think a big part of it is I like to ask them, pick their brain. If I didn't know them before, is like, hey, when you were younger, what did you used to do? And there's one kid in particular, and literally he said him and his dad would just go hit three times a week, and his dad would just tell him, swing it as fast as you can. Like, I don't mm-hmm. care, hit or miss, like you're 8, 9, 10, 11, I don't care, like swing it as fast as you can. Learn how to move fast right now. Yeah. And he said, now all of a sudden that he's 15, 16, like he can, let's narrow it down to focus on direction and this other stuff. But the dad was on point with it where that's early on, just build bat speed, build athleticism. And then as we can continue to get older, We'll work on balance. We'll work on this other stuff. Not saying that's not important, but that can come at the end. So let's build that engine up really fast first, and then we'll add on all the parts that go with it. So that's one piece of advice if you're out there listening is swing fast and move fast and learn how to do it. And the more you do it, the better you're going to get at it too. Absolutely. That's good stuff right there, man. But um, I think we could wrap this up now. This was a really great episode right here. Um, We kind of touched on a lot of different things. Is there anything else you want to touch on before we roll out? No, I think we're good to go, man. Yeah, guys. So if you guys enjoyed this episode, I know we kind of we jumped around and had a couple of couple of different topics that we really wanted to get off our chest today. Um, but guys, if you enjoyed it, make sure you guys leave that five star review. Um, hope you guys in, in, enjoy the next episode. We're going to have a couple other guests coming up here soon. I got we got a future All-American then I'm going to uh, mention to talk to Adam here in a minute about him yeah. hopping on soon. So um, looking forward to it, guys. And until next time, we'll see you guys later.